So why did God create flies and cockroaches? <laughs> you may think it kind of strange to even ponder or discuss this question. However, I assure you, this will be introspective in looking at your life and its meaning therein. And it may just change your perspective on life and subsequently bring positive and eternal change in your life as a whole. So just hang with me now and listen very, very carefully with your whole heart and being. Oh, one more thing. I know what you may be thinking. Mark, aren't most politicians really flies and cockroaches? Most definitely. However, maybe they do have a purpose after all. I'll let you decide for yourself. So, why did God create flies and cockroaches? The simple, honest answer will emerge from this thoughtful analysis. From our perspective, it seems like life would be much easier and probably less annoying if those pesky flies and cockroaches didn't exist. For that matter, life would be much easier if certain human beings didn't exist either. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Why did God create the serpent that tempted Eve that led to her downfall along with that of Adam? We can go even further and say because Lucifer is a fallen angel and the father of all lies, even he is a created being and God obviously had some purpose for creating him in the first place knowing what was going to happen. You see, God doesn't cause bad things to happen, but he knows that they're going to happen. That's his attribute of omniscience, which he possesses along with omnipotence and omnipresence. But let's back up a minute and closely look at the sequence of creation. On the first day, God created light. Then on the second day, he created the sky. This is followed by the third day, his creation of dry lands, plants, seas, and trees. The sun and moon and stars were created by God Almighty on the fourth day. It wasn't until the fifth day that God created creatures that live in the sea and those that fly. And on the final day of creation, God created animals that live on the land. And finally, as his ultimate creation, he created a human. Then on the seventh day, God rested, making it the Sabbath as a day of rest. Why did God wait until the very last to create mankind? He only created one human whom he called Adam. Adam is actually the Hebrew word, which means man. Then from Adam's rib, he created the woman whom he called Eve. Many of you know I call my wife my prime rib. Now see, they were in literal Garden of Eden where life was perfect. Food was abundant. Clothing was not yet necessary. And all the creatures which God had made lived peaceably with one another. But since he had chosen to create the serpent, he allowed, not caused, the serpent to tempt his creations. What if there had been no serpent? Obviously, God had a purpose for there being a serpent. The same God who created the majestic lion also created the jackal and the laughing hyena. Apparently, he has an excellent sense of humor. Here's an interesting thought for you. Getting back to our original question about why there are cockroaches in the world today in the first place. Well, first it means that God had reason to create them in the first place. We can agree with that. And now let's fast forward to the time of Noah building the ark. <laughs> I think you see where I'm going with this. I can just imagine Noah and his family going out and seeking everywhere two cockroaches. One male and one female, being able to tell the difference between them, rounding them up, and making sure they got safely onto the ark so they would survive the flood that was about to come. <laughs> they must have, that, that all must have happened because the alternative would have been that cockroaches somehow came along after the time of the ark, and that's evolution, not biblical. When in doubt, I will take scripture over Darwin any day of the week. So today, we have cockroaches. <laughs> we also have those flies that are such a nuisance. And also, they're dirty and spread some disease. They're also an extreme annoyance, too. 
One really freakish experience was at the beginning of the Great Ocean Road in Australia, where the flies there don't just land on you. They dive bomb you and attack you. They don't just want to bug you. They want to harm you. Imagine that. Malevolent, vicious flies. So today, in the year 2022, according to the Jewish calendar at this point, 5,782 years since creation, we live in a very imperfect world where many of the creatures which God created are dangerous if encountered in the wild. Now contrast that with the sweet little kitty or puppy that you adopt and make part of your family. There is a method to my madness, and there is a point where I'm headed. I'm concerned about our realization of what it means that we are created in the image of God. Now, bear with me because we're getting there. Now, I'm one that really doesn't enjoy killing anything ever. Believe it or not, while I know it's necessary and act accordingly, I do not enjoy really killing flies and cockroaches. On the contrary, I know many other very gentle people with the love of God in their heart who take great pleasure in doing just exactly that. I can hear you saying that this is taking introspection way too far. But I do actually think and consider what kind of awareness do these creatures actually have of their own existence. See, they act out of instinct for their own self-preservation. Look how quickly a bug or a cockroach will move if you try to step on it, squash it, or swat it. They don't have a conscious thought as we do, but something in their genetic makeup tells them that their life's about to end if they don't protect themselves by getting out of harm's way. So they do have some awareness of their existence. Yes, even a cockroach or a fly. They don't just stay where they are and wait for you to end their existence in the squishy mess, which you'll have to clean up later, of course. (laughs) So obviously... There are echelons of awareness. We won't go through the whole litany of created beings, obviously. That would wind up being extremely exhausting, and rather than exhausting, well, we would get flat out bored with the process. Let's just move up to those non-human beings that obviously have the greatest individuality. You don't have to do too much study about monkeys, apes, gorillas, and orangutans to see that some of them are rather, well, creative. Then let's look at that precious little canine or feline, that little furry critter who is part of your own family. It is undeniable that there are differences in temperament between various types of dogs, for instance. Well, it's true that pit bulls are often dangerous and can turn on and even kill small children. An elderly lady once had a very gentle blind pit bull who was no danger to anybody. So even within a given species, you know, There are many differences. And now we're down to asking the very important question, which is, why? Why are some individuals with a given species, I should say within a given species, different from others? Thus far, we've only been talking about the animal kingdom, but what about Homo sapiens? Maybe in this day and age, I should clarify the word that just signifies human beings. We're not distinguishing between homo sapiens and something we invent called heterosapiens. Mankind, that is the generic word which is non-gender specific. Humankind, if you prefer. Humanity, in this sense, not in the sense of generosity, compassion, or benevolence, but rather as the only part of God's creation that he gave an immortal soul and a spirit created in his own image. Hmm. As much as we love our precious little pets, and they are a part of the family, we cannot teach them the Word of God, and we cannot bring them up according to His Word as we do our own human offspring. Animals are not capable of the free will to enter or either accept or reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Only human beings are able to do that. Only human beings need to do that. So now, we have reached the point where we should realize that human beings are very unique in all of God's creation. We have the capacity to know who we are, who created us, how we got here, where we're going, and then to act accordingly. But now we get down to the real nitty gritty. What makes us human beings so different from one another? 
I unequivocally declare that it is not just a matter of race or ethnicity. Every human being has the same intellectual capacity and the same spiritual vacuum that needs to be filled by Jesus Christ regardless of the color of their skin or where they came from. But why is there such a variance in how people react to the message of the gospel, which really is the good news? I like to call it the best news. I don't want to get into an in-depth pro-life sermon, but God knew every one of us before he created us and prior to our being in our mother's womb. None of us was truly a blank slate when we emerged into the outside world, nor were those who weren't allowed to emerge into the outside world blank slates either. Their souls and spirits were just recalled to heaven without ever seeing the light of day. The rest of us, who were born and will live until we die, unless we're still here when Jesus returns, we have a responsibility, a huge responsibility, to know why we're here and what makes this life worthwhile. Folks, there's no do-overs. Let's think a little bit about what we just said there. Creation was a one-time event. God created the world. So when did our soul and spirit, the essence of our being, come into existence? Was it just when the sperm and the ovum united and formed the zygote? (laughs) When God created all that exists, obviously, the soul and the spirit, which is now what each of us refers to as I or me or myself, was part of God's creation. He chose when and where to put us into this world and into which embryo and fetus he would infuse a particular soul and spirit. Any one of us could have been born at the time of Socrates, or of Jesus' incarnation, or of Leonardo da Vinci. In our current area, we could have been born in American heartland, in China, in Africa, or even on a small Pacific island. We could also be an indigenous inhabitant of the present-day United States of America. You see, only God knows why he put us where we are and when we are. We had absolutely no choice in that decision, nor is there anything we can do to ever alter it. It is the absolute essence of arrogance for anyone to think that they have control over the gender or sex or whatever euphemism they want to call it. You were born male or female. You are still male or female. You will always be male or female, just as you were the day the doctor issued your birth certificate. Transmogrification is not only unscriptural, it's absolutely psychotic. Now, let's get down to the essence of this discussion. Who am I? Who I am? Why am I who I am? First is the circumstances of my birth, which only God chose and controlled. He didn't ask me in advance. I wasn't available for consultation. My soul and spirit existed, but they were not yet in their current state of life in which we all have self-awareness and free will. To digress only momentarily, I have repeatedly said soul and spirit. Now, in Christian theology, the soul and the spirit are the same immortal essence of our being. The soul is a term which reflects our relationship with others here on earth, and our spirit reflects our immortal and eternal relationship with God. They are not two separate entities. They are simply relational terms that express the same reality of our existence. Our spirit is in our body from the moment of conception until the moment of physical death. At that point, God reclaims us. And though we pay respects for our loved ones at the cemetery as Christians, we know they are not there. Only their mortal remains, which will someday be raised up and reunited with their spirits in a new form when Jesus returns. This applies only to those who have died as believers in him. The destiny of others is not pleasant to discuss, but it is equally irrevocable. Heaven is real, and for so is hell. That's why it isn't just an abstract exercise in philosophy or theology. The reason I've gone to such length at discussing self-awareness is that our thought life is the absolute epitome of who we are. That little cockroach or vicious fly doesn't have such a thought life. Even our sweet, precious little puppy or kitty, they don't have that kind of thought life either. This is something which God Almighty saw fit to instill only in us and all of humankind. 
To say that we collectively have abused and misused it would be the understatement, really, of all time. Most people are not introspective in the least. They eat, sleep, work, play, recreate, recreate, and a lot of activities, most of which could be done by rote without even conscious thought at all. But you and I and everyone else on this planet are capable of making that decision to either accept or reject God's will. The alternative in the short run is to live our life as we please without regard to the consequences. In the long run, it will be the determinant of our destiny. Now, I won't get off on a tangent to talk about politics, but just ask yourself how many of our elected leaders actually ensure that their brain is engaged before putting their mouth in gear. (laughs) But here, I don't want to focus on national governments or a microcosm of society. By your attention so far, you have demonstrated an ability and a willingness to think for yourself. It's very unique. It's a very important sign as well. Whoever you are, wherever you are, you are first and foremost a creation of God. God does not make any mistakes. He created you where and when he created you just exactly as he created you because he knew that's how you should be created. Therefore, you and I have only the responsibility of accepting God's perfect plan for our lives. We're still going to make a lot of choices. Simple things like what we eat and what clothes we wear for the day. And big things like where we go to college whom to marry, if anybody, and what career to pursue in our lives. But all these pale in comparison with that free will which reflects the image of God in us. I can think about what I choose. Right now, I'm concentrating on sharing this message with you. But that's my choice. My mind has an extensive repertoire of subject matter available, just as yours does, too. I can reminisce about anything that's ever happened in my life. I can plan for something I'm going to do in the future or that long-awaited dream trip. I have that choice over my stream of thought. I don't have to just respond to immediate stimuli. Now, that is what distinguishes me and you and every human being from every lower species on planet Earth. It also distinguishes us from those who fail to exercise this unique capability until it atrophies and becomes inoperative. So, let us discipline our minds to select that which is of importance and screen out all the noise and clutter that bombards us every day as viciously as those flies we talked about earlier. Our brain is the physical substance, the gray matter. Our mind is the immaterial thought being that is in each of us. Now, going back to our opening question about why God created flies and cockroaches, (laughs) you can say that they are very far below our level of existence. But that gap between them and us is nowhere near the extent of the chasm between our mortality and God's immortality. To be fully human and not just an empty android absent soul and spirit, our conscious commitment to recognize God as the supreme authority and Jesus Christ as his divine manifestation for our salvation are the fulfillment of the whole purpose of creation. God's not glorified in flies and cockroaches which cannot acknowledge and worship him. Listen carefully. He created us because only we can have that self-awareness and free will that enables us to worship him rather than reject him. This means that those who either consciously reject him or just ignore his call in their life, either deliberately or by default, have set their own destiny apart from him. Other than physical torment, separation from God is the true punishment, which is hell. So, what is the meaning of life? It is being reunited with God from whence came our soul and spirit, and is the only reason we exist as human beings. Otherwise, we're no better off than that fly or that cockroach. So, God created flies and cockroaches to teach us this most important lesson of all, which holds the key to the gates of paradise. (laughs) Just think about this talk the next time you're pestered by that fly 
or that cockroach. <laughs>